Hello and welcome to our next reflection. Uh, and today we continue with the mysteries of Jesus' public life. Remember what I said yesterday, and that each of those mysteries of Jesus' life, uh, we are called to enter into them. Uh, we are called to relive them within our life. And the richness of our life, uh, the richness of our eternal life, of a life of communion with God, uh, is to be found precisely in our conscious living out of those mysteries, and to become more aware that we are invited and we actually share in that life of Christ daily. And so our public life, the public ministry of Jesus, as well as ours, our life in the Church, begins with the moment of baptism. The baptism is the moment where the Spirit descends upon Jesus in a visible form, where the, vo the voice of the Father uh, speaks and bears witness uh, to the fact that Jesus is the Beloved One and that we are to listen to Him. This is where we find our eternal life. This is where we find our happiness, our peace, our joy, our rest, in listening to what the Word of God wishes to tell us. And so the Spirit uh, takes over Jesus in a visible way. And the Spirit who was there, remember, from the very beginning of his conception, uh, now descends on him in a public way. And we, in the Church, when we are baptized, we enter into the same mystery. We become the beloved children of God. We also have a mission. The Spirit also comes down on us and leads us forward, leads us onward into our life. We are the beloved ones of God. And we share in that mystery of baptism, we share in the mystery of Jesus' death and resurrection. What happens straight after? Straight after Jesus is led out to be tempted by the devil. Remember, it's the Spirit's overall guidance that leads Jesus uh, into that occasion. God is in charge. Uh, God is the master of everything that happens. And Jesus, in his time of temptation, defeats Satan for us. Uh, the temptations uh, are trying to undermine Jesus' own self-identity as the beloved Son of God. The temptations for us will also come down to the same thing. The evil one will try to undermine who we are. He will try to undermine our belief that we are also the beloved children of God, loved eternally, forgiven, redeemed through the death and resurrection of Christ. The evil one wants us to forget about all this. He wants us to believe something else about ourselves. Uh, but Jesus has conquered him, and Jesus is telling us we can also conquer him if we stay close to the Lord, if we follow his way of life, if we listen to his words. In those temptations, Jesus, has, Jesus is showing us that he is the Messiah, but in a different way from what the devil would like to attribute to him or other people. And so God's way of being Messiah is different from what the people were expecting this Messiah to do and be. And so the plan and the will of the Father is to gather disciples around Jesus, uh, to gather all nations in order to save them. And to save them, they need to be uh, focused and gathered around Christ. And this is the beginning of the Church. This gathering of all people, this gathering of disciples, is the Church. A sign of the Kingdom of God. And this is the message of Christ. This is the first message that Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. The establishment of a new family. Uh, centered now around the person of Jesus, united by one faith. 
Uh, and so God calls this gathering together. He calls the church into being to be a sign of that coming kingdom of God. The kingdom of God that is to come, that we are awaiting for, and at the same time that is already here. The church is here. Christ is here. All the treasures uh, acquired for us by Christ are already here to make use of. And this kingdom is meant for everyone. Everyone is invited to join the kingdom. Everyone is welcome in the universal church of God. But the message of that kingdom and the invitation uh, is particularly for the poor and the lowly ones, for the humble ones, uh, because they are the ones who understand the message of that kingdom. The wise and the clever, the learned, cannot see all these mysteries. For them, these truths are hidden. And so we are asked to become, as children of God, we are asked to become humble in order to understand the kingdom of God within us. And that kingdom grows through many signs that accompany the mission of the disciples, of the apostles. And the signs are also among us. Numberless miracles, conversions, healings, exorcisms, all point to the fact that Jesus is freeing us. He is redeeming us. And note that Jesus did not come to abolish all evil or to eradicate all evil. He is primarily here to free us from the gravest slavery, and that is sin. That's his main preoccupation. He could easily have healed all the sick people. He could easily come now and heal all the sick people in the hospitals. He could ensure there is no poverty on this earth. But he's leaving us to live his mysteries, to continue his mission, and to focus on the most important of all. And that is to be free of sin, to bring that freedom to other people. And that means action, action that is left to us. So often we complain that why is God allowing this to happen? Why does God not do anything? Well, God has left us to be his living presence for others and among others. It is for us to help and alleviate the poverty of others. It is for us to share what we have, and we have things in abundance. There's plenty, plenty, enough for everyone in this world. If only we learn to share. If only we uh, become charitable. And that means filled with real love for another human being. The other thing that Jesus uh, does in the kingdom is he hands over the keys of the kingdom to Peter. He is giving him a special mission, a special authority to govern the house of God, to govern the church of God. And so Peter for us in our day and time is the person of the Pope, uh, who has a special place among all the other disciples, among all the other uh, apostles among the bishops of our present church. Uh, and so Peter, the Pope, has this special place and he's been given this authority to govern. Uh, at the same time, uh, whatever you loose on earth will be loosened, whatever you bind on earth will be bound. And in this, uh, he is given the authority to absolve sins, uh, to set out doctrinal judgments, to make statements with regards to our faith and what we believe in, uh, to make disciplinary decisions in the church, uh, to guide us in our daily life, to guide us in our Christian following of Jesus. He is setting this out in the context of his passion. His kingdom doesn't come by force. His kingdom doesn't come by violence. 
His kingdom comes by our humble submission to the will of the Father. And the will of the Father culminates in Jesus' passion and death on the cross. And that means his suffering and death. He has to go through this experience. Peter, nor the other disciples, understand this. They struggle with it. And so they are being taken to experience the transfiguration. They are witnesses to Jesus' appearing to them in glory, as a foretaste of this kingdom. I am the source of glory. I am the source of the Spirit to all nations. Look at me. But here am I. I need to suffer. I need to teach you the way you need to follow me. Uh, and so the struggle for us to realize that our Lord and his moment of glory, his moment of conquering evil, is the moment of his death on the cross. The Lord is reigning from the wood of the cross. And from that moment he is predicting, he is talking about his passion and resurrection to his disciples. He knows that the suffering awaits him, that the culminating point of our redemption is still to come. And so he sets his face towards Jerusalem, the place where the prophets of God have been killed in the past, the place where he also needs to go to and experience and share in the same death. And so he enters Jerusalem, and we're now in Holy Week, uh, Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of the Messiah, acclaimed by the poor and by the children as the one who will bring salvation. Hosanna to the King of Kings, Hosanna to the Son of David. And so we are caught up in this great mystery of spreading the kingdom of God within us. The good news is it's not up to you and me alone. The kingdom of God is a gift. Uh, the kingdom of God comes to us as a gift from God. What we can do is to get out of the way, is to not impede its spread, and to bear witness to it. The actual growth is for God to do and accomplish. Our mission is to reflect, to what degree do I take part in these mysteries of the kingdom? How do I contribute to its spread and its growth? How do I bear witness to it in my daily life? God bless.